Research has too often been done in silos, with great focus on a narrow area of expertise. But through shared knowledge and access to data, wider problems can be solved. From inequality to sustainability. From helping our ageing population to better ways of raising our children. It's that spark of an idea disrupting what we know. By thinking differently, our behaviour will change. This research is already happening. But now there is a new home in Cardiff that brings it together. A place open to the world that celebrates and encourages innovative thinking, collaborative working and sharing ideas. The world's first social science research park, Spark. A spark to change our futures. Good morning, everyone. It's a beautiful day here in Cardiff, and I hope the sun is shining where you all are. Um, I'm Charlotte Stevenson, a business development manager at Cardiff University, working in professional development. Welcome to day two of our virtual summer school. Um, this is the third year that we've run um, a virtual summer school, and they were born out of the pandemic when we couldn't do any sort of face-to-face -face CPD activity. Um, and they've grown over the years as we've done it. And this year we're focusing on the fantastic range and breadth of Cardiff University research going on. Um, before we get going today, a few couple of bits of housekeeping. Um, we've got the question and answer section at the bottom. If you've got any questions for our speaker today, please pose them in there as we're going along and I'll make sure that we ask them at the end. There's the chat function available. If you've got any questions or, or, or any technical issues, let them uh, pop them in there and the three of us will be able to answer you directly. We're still working from different locations. So just bear with us if we've got any technical problems or any interruptions today. And just a reminder that we'll be circulating some evaluations about this session and any other sessions that you're attending at the end of the virtual summer school, which will be the end of next week. Um, I'm thrilled to introduce our speaker this morning, Phil Butler, who's going to discuss the Thinks Behavioural Marker System. Over to you, Phil. Charlotte. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen first, so bear with me a second, folks. Okay, so um, Vorada, everybody. Good morning. Um, as Charlotte says, it's a lovely day in Cardiff. And uh, my name is Dr. Philip Butler, and uh, I spent uh, 31 years in the Fire and Rescue Service. Um, 27 of those were as an incident commander in the service, and, and 25 of those spent in London, in the London Fire Brigade. Um, and uh, the thing that motivates my my research is the fact that during that 31 year career, 33 firefighters lost their lives responding to an incident, which was was horrific, uh, you know, over one a year, which which I, you know, I didn't really appreciate if I'm honest until I, I, I retired. Um, but of those 33, there were eight people that were in the same fire and rescue service as I was serving uh, at the time of their death. So um, that's what's motivated me uh, over the last uh, seven years since I've retired from the service. Uh, so we're gonna focus first of all on some human factors and safety issues. And I just want you to take a moment to read this, um, this little statement here. So as you can see, it states that in this operational environment, there are hierarchical, multidisciplinary teams working on complex situations that are characterized by high risks and time pressure. There is a can-do work culture, and the analysis of the adverse event revealed that there were failures in situation awareness, decision-making, teamwork, and leadership. Um, that probably sounds quite familiar in terms of a working environment for incident commanders. 
for those of you that are, or if anyone else, frankly, works in a critical incident uh, scenario, either say as a, uh, a pilot or within healthcare as a surgeon or anesthetist, um, you can see that that's, that sort of reflects that type of high pressure, high risk environment where people endeavor to do their best. This example didn't come from the fire service. It actually is part of the Deepwater Horizon report, which happened back in 2010 and with which many of you are probably familiar. Um, but what it shows is that there are similar types of working environments across a range of high reliability industries from oil and gas exploration, such as the case of Deepwater Horizon and through to the Fire and Rescue Service. And we have had over the last 20 years or so, a number of incidents where things have not gone right for us. Um, and there's a range of incidents that you can see posted there. The one thing that links those all together is that the investigations or the inquiries that followed them have all highlighted problems with uh, human factors, specifically with non-technical command skills. So the UK Fire and Rescue Service refers to non-technical skills, which are your social, personal and cognitive skills that are used uh, to um, that contribute towards safety and effectiveness. Um, that it terms them command skills. So for the remainder of this presentation, if I use the term non-technical or command skill, they are both interchangeable. So what happens is that human errors can be caused by uh, poor performance with respect to command skills. So this is the definition of human error that I use. So it's a planned action that has failed to achieve its desired outcome without the intervention of some chance, bad luck, or unforeseeable agency. In other words, something that you couldn't have possibly anticipated as happening. And the reason that they fail is because of a, a failure to do with um, your level of knowledge, an individual's skills, or indeed just our plain human limitations that we all have to do with things like the limited capacity of our working memories. So when we first were an incident commander, and it might have been for some of you something like that, uh, starting my career in Dorset, uh, it didn't look too different to that for me. Um, there were definitely a number of things going through my mind as to what on earth I should do. Uh, a lot of considerations that I was thinking about. Um, at the same time as that was going on, I was worried about the risks involved um, and, and the fire might get a lot worse and spread. Uh, whilst at the same time, there were emotions involved uh, and, and there was a bit of fear as to, you know, performance, anxiety, perhaps uh, contributing towards that too. Um, but one of the things that we uh, recognise within the Fire and Rescue Service is that as you become more senior in rank or role, um, the incidents that you're expected to be in charge of, they also increase in complexity um, and, so, and so therefore increase in risk. More people's lives are at risk. There are a greater number of hazards, a greater number of different agencies trying to work together to resolve the same problem. Um, so what we need to do, the role of the fire service, uh, is to prepare incident commanders so that their knowledge and skills keeps pace with the level of risk they're expected to manage as an incident commander. So what are some of the influences then on an incident commander? So we have individual characteristics, and that could be down to things like your level of stress that day, or how confident you feel with dealing with the incident that's in front of you. Uh, it could be some characteristics of the incident. Do you have to apply um, operational discretion? Are you having to go outside of standard operating procedures and use your professional judgment? Um, or it could be the fact that it was uh, the ambient environment was affecting you. So it was a bitterly cold day or an extremely hot day. And then there are characteristics with the, the command support that you get, the, 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 the crew or the individuals that come out to support you in terms of, you know, sending back your radio messages, 
providing you with information from the systems available on a building, for example, um, giving you advice about the standard operating procedures and so on and so forth. And that could involve things such as how useful is that information to you? How usefully is it displayed on the back of a, a pump, on the back of a, in, inside a command vehicle? Um, and likewise with your command team. So that's the team of people that you, you create on the day to deal with your incidents. So that's your sector commanders and your safety officers and people like that. How familiar are they with each other? Do they know each other? And how big is that team? And then there are some other influences, things that we might not consider, such as your culture within your organization and how that can influence your command. And even the time of day. So we perform differently because of our circadian rhythm. Uh, we perform differently at three o'clock in the morning compared to say three o'clock in the afternoon. So for many years, the UK Fire and Rescue Service has paid attention to human factors. So when I joined the service in 1984, you can see that this was the manual that was present at the time. And it was telling me that these were what was expected of me as a firefighter. Uh, this was majorly overhauled in 2005 with the personal qualities and attributes that were introduced into the UK Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, and you can see there that there are uh, clearly ones that deal with communication skills or social skills. They term them into personal skills. Um, and you can see teamwork, communication within there. You can also see problem solving and situational awareness uh, against information management and planning and implementing against organizational commitment. More recently, in the current version of the Skills for Justice Incident Command qualifications, you can see that they also incorporate a number of different references to uh, command skills or non-technical skills. So we can see leadership mentioned. We can see risk mentioned, communication is mentioned, um, and, and briefing uh, as a specific element of communication is referred to as well. And on the right hand side of the image, you can see that planning is also incorporated within that. Um, and having an ability to determine or size up or gauge, uh, develop a, a situational awareness of an incident is also a feature of these, of these qualifications. And these that applies pretty much from initial right the way up to advanced level incident command. And even more recently, the national skills framework has been developed. Um, and you can see there that there are a number of, um, uh, there are different, there are four pillars of, of the uh, national, uh, national leadership framework. So personal impact includes references to being people oriented, um, outstanding leadership, accepting leadership's there in its own right, but also beneath that you see things like being an authentic communicator or collaboration oriented. And with respect to service delivery, it, it involves problem solving. And in terms of organizational effectiveness, it involves commanding and uh, being a decision maker. All of these uh, are clearly command skills that feature within uh, a range of historical and current documents uh, and publications for the Fire and Rescue Service. So this slide very simply demonstrates the relationship that there is between practicing using your command skills and, and, and making an error as an incident commander. So if you practice command skills poorly, in other words, you don't perform them very well, then an error is more likely, which increases the chance of an adverse event. Uh, and, and, and the opposite is true if you perform them really well. So you either avoid error altogether, or if you do make an error, you capture it, you recognize you've made one and intervene to mitigate the effect it has on your operations. And therefore you decrease the chance of an adverse event occurring. Um, and just to finish off this model, um, you can see that any learning that comes out of the, the events that do occur um, should include identifying any things to do with the command skills that we used in order to feed that back into related training and assessment. Hopefully, many of you are familiar with the Swiss cheese model of accident causation, which was developed by Professor James Reason. 
So you have the uh, hazard, and between the hazard and, an, and, a, and a serious outcome, you have a series of barriers. Um, but over time, as you can see by the holes that have been generated there, um, those defensive barriers become weakened, um, uh, either by certain active failures, which are those that occur, uh, you know, say immediately. So that's something that happens whilst you're in charge of an incident, for example or a latent condition, which could be uh, a, a, a standard operating procedure that hasn't been updated in accordance with the frequency with which it should have been. And so there's a legacy within that document that is out of date um, and problematic as a result. Um, but obviously they all have to line up. So the holes within these defensive layers all have to line up for an accident to occur. Um, now, if that's a factory um, operating, um, then we, this has already occurred as far as we're concerned in the fire service. And so we make an intervention and practice those command skills. And we can be regarded as heroes, humans as heroes, as a phrase coined by Professor James Reason. And what he means by that is because we are really flexible, intelligent and clever, we are able to be creative and make interventions that can make uh, the accident outcome uh, much smaller than it otherwise would have been without us turning up. But of course, as we've seen, we have attended incidents where the opposite has been true, where we have made errors and the accident outcome has been exacerbated, uh, either through the loss of additional life or property or by the loss of uh, uh, the lives of some firefighters attending the scene. <clears throat> so how can we measure these command skills, how, how are they measured? Well, they're measured by behavioral marker systems. These are systems that have been used in many different industries, high reliability industries over many years. So for example, the first ones were introduced into the aviation industry back in the late 1970s, early 1980s, and they remained ever present uh, in, that, in that industry. Um, healthcare in the UK since the sort of turn of the century, since the turn of the century, has embraced uh, a number of different behavioural marker systems. You can see the example, examples there relate to surgery anaesthetists and scrub practitioners, i.e. the nurses that support surgeons within the theatre. So what is a behavioural marker system? Well, it includes a clearly defined set of skills. These skills describe a specific observable behavior uh, for each one. There is a specific observable behaviors for each one, I beg your pardon. So for example, if we take the skill of briefing, then active listening would be a sub-skill or a behavior that you'd expect to see. The skills need to demonstrate some sort of causal relationship with performance outcomes. So for example, if you take the skill of cooperation, then cooperating with others in the, in inevitably, if it's done well, leads to effective coordinated actions. And we need also to recognize that, you know, when you're putting a small bin out, um, you don't have to use all those skills. So they're not always needed in all situations. We also need to recognize the relevance of the skills depends on the context. So there is a different skill set required to deal with, uh, to be in charge of a, a London bombing related incident or a terrorist related incident compared to dealing with a, an automatic fire alarm. And importantly, they need to reflect industry specific language. So they're very easily understood by those that need to use them, either as someone who's assessing someone else or and giving feedback to an individual or the person on the end of that feedback. They need to be simple in terms of their phraseology. So use, use of plain English is really important. Again, this aids their, uh, you know, aids their uh, usability um, and, and, and ensures that people understand the nature of feedback, for example, that they get. And they need to describe clear concepts that the industry recognizes as being important. So this, schematic shows a, it's sort of a combination of uh, the Swiss cheese model, um, but presented slightly differently. So you can see on the left-hand side, 
We have the decision making that goes on at a corporate level in an organization uh, or say the fire and, a fire and rescue service in this case, the decisions they make and the priorities they place on work streams and the policies that they implement to support those. Now that's where latent conditions can arise from. Well, actually at the incident ground, you get the conditions for errors and for violation of policies. And that means that you can have unsafe conditions at the incident ground. And then when we come down to the next layer, which is that of the incident commander, these are the individuals who will make an error or violate a policy. And that's the unsafe act. These are the active failures about which I spoke of earlier. And there you see the defensive barriers that are in place um, in order to prevent uh, an incident outcome that's not wanted. So for example, you could your SOPs would fit be one of those barriers. Uh, the equipment and the communication systems that you use would be one of those defensive barriers. And this is where Thinks fits in as well. So if you are conducting Thinks assessments at real incidents um, as part of your quality assurance or in training exercises or in simulations indoors, then Thinks assessments adds to that little portfolio of barriers that are associated with preparedness and training. So let's move on to talk a bit more about the system itself. So hopefully I've established that the importance of command skills for incident commanders and how they are, how they can influence um, the likelihood of you making an error as an incident commander um, and being involved in an incident that has an unwanted outcome. Sorry, I should have pressed this little button first and then said it. Um, so apologies for that. Um, but there we go. So you can see there that that is the think system. What that represents are the six main skills of the think system uh, that, that comprise it. So what is the purpose of it? Well, it's to assist in meeting the need to better understand human factors and their practice to improve safety on the incident ground. And it achieves that by giving you something to measure them by. Um, it, it does it by uh, enabling individuals to receive feedback on their performance in relation to their use of the command skills. Um, it helps generate data that can be part of your safety management systems or your training uh, training review systems uh, that demonstrate, because if you are providing, for example, command skills training, if you're providing decision-making training, um, then you should be able to see those that have been trained to perform better in that skill through the data generated by things. And importantly, for the first time, it's provided the service with a vocabulary to talk about things like leadership, things like situational awareness and teamwork. So what are the skills in full? So here we have the skill set with regards to leadership, so you can see that that has five sub skills. That's the only one that does. Then we have the effective decision making, interpersonal communication, personal resilience, situation awareness, and teamwork and interoperability. So what was interesting from the workshops with subject matter experts that were used to develop these um, was the greater or a lot how much emphasis was placed on leadership um, there was a lot of um, combining and reducing going on from what was originally 59 different skills that were identified uh, to, to get it down to six comprising of 20 sub skills and, uh, and yet leadership still retained um, the highest number. But as you can see, um, we have one there called personal resilience. So that's, as, you, as reflected by the subskills, is all about being resilient to those factors that can influence you as an incident commander. Um, and teamwork and interoperability takes account of the fact that we have to create a team as incident commanders, but at the same time, we also work with other teams at the scene of an incident from other agencies, such as the police and the ambulance services. 
each one of those skills has a definition and each one of the sub skills has a definition. So let's take a look at uh, what it says for intuitive decision making, uh, sorry, for decision making. So here we have intuitive decision making, uh, analytical and planning that forms the decision making command skill. Um, and you can see that intuitive decision making is about associating cues in the environment to appropriate interventions. So this is a very much a see do type of decision making process that's going on here. You are reacting to what you see and perceive in the environment. Um, and using your experience to help focus that lens on what you look at in the environment in order to make a decision. But importantly, you make sure that decision is the correct one and appropriate for the existing situation. If we now take a look at um, the cues associated with, uh, sorry, if we take a look at what the behavioral markers are for that subskill intuitive decision making, then we can see that we, they are separated first and foremost into a small set of good practice behavioral markers and poor practice behavioral markers. So these things, as you can see, are observable. So if you're rating someone's performance, whilst these aren't everything you might see that's good about intuitive decision making, they at least train, begin to train your eye as to what to look for. So one of the things that you would want to see, for example, is that if we look on the good practice side, is that the response to the cues in the environment is to make a quick decision, but at the same time validate that using the decision control process. So how do we use things? So this is the very simple, very familiar process of, of uh, assessment using the thinks process, something that hopefully you've seen and then you do already. So it involves observation, it involves reviewing what you've observed, giving that some sort of score or rating in this case, and then providing feedback to the individual. So it doesn't differ at all really from existing assessment practices. And this is a document that you can use to uh, record your observations on. So you can see that there are, it's broken up into various columns. Um, we have those brightly colored columns represent the different command skills and the numbers that you can see that have got red circles on represent which subskill of that command skill that one of the observations on the right hand side is referring to. And then in between those two, we have a just brief description of what the incident commander was doing at the time. Um, and as you can also see, they're timed. So if we were to add to this entry, we would first put down what the time is and what the, what's going on at that moment in time. In this case, uh, the incident commander is briefing the command unit crew on the situation and what support they desire. And the observations that we make are, you know, that there was a clear and structured briefing, that they, uh, that they asserted their authority to interrupt the crew, to update them and declare what their priorities were. Um, and that the command unit team leader um, was required to staff the incident commander. In other words, that they were to support them, be on their shoulder, deal with any of their requests for information or messages to be sent. Um, and we can show by color or by a tick or a cross whether or not we thought at that time when we recorded those observations, whether we thought they fell onto the good practice side or the poor practice side. And you can see that each one of those observations re relates to one of the encircled, um, one of the encircled sub skills on this side. So if we take um, this one here, which is about leadership style, that would record the second one where they asserted their authority to inter interrupt the crew to update them on uh, update them and declare their priorities, which was felt to be um, a positive thing to have done. So what about the review process then? Well, this captures the review process. So once the uh, incident's finished or the exercise has ended or the assessment is over, then those that are tasked with uh, running the, the incident, uh, sorry, running the assessment or assessing the individuals, I should say, they will then sit down and review the observations that they've made. And the first thing to do if you're using the paper-based system is that you need to sort of mentally collate all your observations against each of the subskills in one place within your mind's eye. Because when you um, award a rating, it's not per observation, 
It's in the round, in the, in the, the overview that you get from your observations, what rating does that attract for each of the subskills that you've made a rating it and made an observation against? So part of that consideration of those subskills in total is to consider the nature of the activities that go along with them. Some are more high risk than others. Uh, what is the balance? A simple check of how many red or how many green pieces of text you've got or how many ticks versus how many crosses you've noted might give you an indication as to which way your rating may go. And then you need to consider what you haven't observed but should have observed in terms of their performance and what impact has that had on their command. And then you identify the fifth point there is to identify any patterns that occur. So you might see different patterns of behavior during the dynamic phase compared to say the recovery phase of an incident. Um, and then you need to consider if the subskill performance is anything other than satisfactory. So one of the ways in which you can help mitigate biases that we all have when we watch someone else, someone that we might know, for example, perform and we have to rate their performance. A way in which you can help mitigate any bias you might carry is to begin, is to think very clearly at the start and throughout the process, what is it about this performance that I'm that's moving me away from them being satisfactory, either to below that level or above that level? So your starting point is with every incident commander you begin to, uh, to observe, this is a satisfactorily performing incident commander, and you're looking to, for things that take you away from that perspective. This is the rating scale that comes along with DINKS. So you can see essentially it is a five point rating scale from zero to four. So four, as you can see, represents uh, exemplary performance, something that was consistently high um, uh, that you would, for example, if you had filmed it, you would use that to train other people. Satisfactory is exactly what it says, but as with all things that are satisfactory, there is room for improvement to get them up to a good level of performance. Marginal is again pretty much what it said. It was an inconsistent and ultimately unacceptable performance. So there were some really good bits, but there are also some subpar bits that require development. And then there's a poor performance, which if you like is a consistently below par performance with substantial improvement required across the skill set. And unobserved. So this is an omission to perform a skill. Now the reason less is in here is because um, one of the biases that we suffer from is omission bias, which is where if we don't see something do so, if we don't see someone do something, then we don't rate that as bad as if we had seen them do something that was bad. So part of the logic of incorporating this was to counteract that bias. But also we know of incidents such as uh, the Golston Mine incident, where things were omitted to be done, leadership was, was absent, uh, in, in the final set of group commanders that were in charge of that incident um, that ultimately led to the death of a member of the public. And then we have this additional category of not observed, and that's in there because sometimes you're either not in, not in command for long enough to use all the skills that you would otherwise have used, um, or a skill isn't simply suitable to the context of the incident that's being dealt with. Um, and so to avoid someone being penalized unfairly um, for not using a subskill, um, then that, that is in there to take account of that. So just to show you how that works, what impact that uh, zero versus not observed has. So when we look at this rating here for interpersonal communication, we can see that we've awarded threes and a one for briefing. Um, and then simple for the to get your command skill rating, it's just the sort of average of those numbers, which gives us 2.33. On the other hand, if we were to have thought the briefing so poor that it was dangerous to others, then we would still maybe give them a three for listening, still give them a three for communication style, but now we've given them a zero. So in this case, the zero counts as a dividing factor, which means you end up with a two. Uh, on alternatively, if the, the, you know, the individual had to hand over command before they had a chance to brief anybody, so therefore it was a not observed skill in this case, it doesn't then count as a dividing factor, which means that you end up for the same numbers, a rating of three, which is satisfactory.
So when we come to giving feedback, in the paper-based version of things, there is just the usual cover sheet, which gives the rough details of what was going on, who was involved in the assessment process, um, and what the nature of that process was. In this case, it was a simulation suite exercise. And then the, the, each of the command skills has a, a, uh, a section that looks like the two before you. So these represent effective decision-making and planning and interpersonal communication. So you can see that the red circles that were on the observation street, uh, sheets have now transferred themselves to represent a number against the, uh, the sub-skill that they were uh, re related to earlier. Um, and some feedback has been given for planning, even though it was satisfactory. So this is the rater saying, I'm gonna take this opportunity to give this individual a bit of feedback to, to, to highlight how well they've done and to try and encourage them to, to punch up to a level four. So if we were to add to that, well, let's say that we'll stick with our threes for communication style and listening, but we want to give some feedback on rating, on briefing, I beg your pardon. So you can see here that it's quite detailed, or, but not particularly overbearing. So it's about three or four sentences. And we've decided to give this individual a four. Now, the think system demands that where you give somebody a four or a zero, you have to provide written feedback against those two scores. And in this case, when we calculate what the average is, we end up with 3.33. So it's on the way to being good. Um, and so this, what, this, what you can see within the context of that feedback is that it clearly defines why the, the, the four has been awarded. In other words, what rating has been given is clearly identifiable to the individual receiving the feedback. Um, and it, it may include an example from the observations to back that up. Um, it can, in this case, it includes, includes praise in terms of the well done. Um, and then it explains why it's good to do this. So it talks about how briefing is a vital control component for an incident commander, because quite often when, you, when you're briefing a sector commander as an IC, um, that's probably the last time you see them for the next two to three hours, perhaps. Um, and then it then recognises you know, what you should carry on doing. So to keep this level of performance up, you need to continue to use uh, the service methods for briefing and within JESSIP to maintain, uh, and, the, and the JESSIP method of briefing in order to maintain the level of performance. So it's short and sweet, but precise and clearly explains to the individual why they got the result that they did. Now, I've mentioned a paper-based version, and that's and the reason I was using that phrase is because there's also a Thinks app, which was funded by the Economic and Social Research Council. Um, and you'll be pleased to know that it replicates a lot of what you've just seen through the paper-based system uh, and automates much of that. Um, and also, it produces a very handy spreadsheet to add to any database that you set up as an organisation. Um, and it's free. The whole think system to local authority fire and rescue services is completely and utterly free. Um, and this is how it's used. So here are some examples. So top left, we've got a couple of images that show its use within a computer simulation suite. Here we see an individual rating someone's performance off of a video uh, of their incident command assessment, for example. And obviously, in a live exercise environment, uh, you can see the, uh, in the, the app, in this case, being used to rate our incident commander over here. And then this is the giving of the feedback. So the beauty of the app is that it organizes everything nice and neatly for you so that the moment you've decided what you're going to give that feedback upon and what it is and typed it into the app, you can then use the app to deliver that feedback in, in the way of a hot debrief around the back of the pump. So what are the benefits of things? So some of you may recall that there was a, the Future of Incident Command document produced in 2015 by the National Fire Chiefs Council. Um, and so things help support some of the things in there that, that were prioritized as in need of attention. So by forming part of a command skills training program, it will help enhance the judgment of risk because you're looking at that as an observer as to how people go about judging the risk. It will improve decision making. It will also help improve incident command in the face of reducing opportunities 
for commanders to gain operational experience, simply because you're not just getting technical feedback on how well you implemented a procedure, for example, um, but you're also getting uh, feedback on how you behaved as an incident commander, how you were as an incident commander, and how that affected your performance and the outcomes of the incident as a result. And also, by it will generate data to validate the training, um, or more, perhaps more importantly, to inform some of your safety management systems. Here we can see that it will in that data will also provide you with evidence um, of the impact of command skills performance upon incident or accident outcomes. And it may identify some human errors within that and their reduction over time to improve safety. And as an assessment tool, it can be used to improve your selection, assessment and development of incident commanders. So either by facilitating the monitoring and rating of command skills in a training and assessment environment under incidents, um, or by uh, and by providing you that vocabulary to discuss command skills with people in a meaningful way that both sides of the discussion understand. And fundamentally, it supports uh, meeting the challenges of incident command by providing an assessment tool that's now referenced within national operational guidance for incident command in the UK. And oh, yes, did I mention it was free? One other thing to say that I've not included in the slide because it's, it's fairly recent is that Cardiff University are currently now in the uh, are working with the National Fire Chiefs Council uh, to enable the National Fire Chiefs Council to take over responsibility for things um, and the administration of that system, which is a fantastic, um, fantastic outcome for the research that's been carried on here at Cardiff, that uh, the service for which it was undertaken um, has now what is now wanting to take it over um, in order to, to ensure its long term sustainability within the service. And finally, um, I just want to say a big thank you to the following people, Professor Rob Honey and Dr. Sabrina Cohen Hatton, who were my supervisors of my PhD, uh, the Cardiff University's Research and Innovation Services, who've worked very hard on the development of Think's licenses and, uh, and all the legal issues around um, producing something like that, uh, that, that is to be shared with others for free, as opposed to charging them money. Um, the National Fire Chiefs Council for co-producing my research from start to finish over the last seven years, uh, and they continue to do so. Uh, my Oxygen for developing the app. Uh, the Fire Service Research and Training Trust for feigning, for, for funding, I should say, a seven month long evaluation of the THINK system involving seven different fire and rescue services, which you can see displayed there. So thank you to all of those and the people that were involved um, from those services. And finally, the Economic, Social and Research Council, Economic and Social Research Council, sorry, and Cardiff University for assisting me along with my PhD in terms of funding and support. And uh, any questions? Um, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, if that's, if that's OK with everybody. Thanks, Phil. That was really, really informative. Um, there's time at the end, so if anybody wants to pose any questions to Phil, just pop them in the Q&A. Alternatively, if you think the question is, is, is quite a complicated one or, or long-winded one, raise your hand or, or pop it in the chat and we'll be able to unmute you so you can sort of verbally say the question um, to Phil. Um, while while sort of people are carrying on typing in some more questions, Phil, yeah. um, a few other questions we've got here. Could things be expanded or adapted to be applied to other emergency services? So it's an interesting question, a really good question, actually, because um, it, it has started. So within the emergency services, there is the only one that has a behavioral market system at the moment is the fire and rescue service. If you look in other industries, um, have they adapted behavioral market systems for one part of an industry to, to for another? And the answer is yes. Um, it's mainly involved uh, a, a, an overhaul of the terminology involved. So yes, that is something that I think can be done uh, as long as it's done with sensitivity and with you know involving representatives from the um, from the police or the ambulance service, uh, Coast Guard, RNI, whoever that um, we regard as an emergency service, yeah. 
Fantastic. Um, have you got any examples of when things have been used in practice that you could share with us? Uh, so, well, obviously I've used it a lot myself in research, but um, Hampshire Fire and Rescue Service, I would hold up as a as a as the sort of exemplar service that's that's taken on board and fully embraced things. So if anyone's interested to know how they've gone about doing that, how they've integrated it into their assessments, into their training, into their um, uh, into the, uh, across the different levels of command that they have within that service, then I would encourage them to get in touch with Hampshire Fire and Rescue Service and um, and set up a conversation with them because they will be much better able to describe how they've gone about doing that than I would ever do ever ever give it justice. They've been phenomenal. Um, you, you've left your email address up on that last slide. I presume that means you're happy to be contacted yes. by anybody who's on the call or, or you know, to, to sort of discuss further further issues, further sort of questions that they have so sort of offline. Very um, much. The app that you mentioned there sounds absolutely fantastic. Hmm. You mentioned it's free, which is amazing. Yes. How, how, would we, how do people go about downloading that? Is it on the app store? Is there somewhere specific they can get it? So, so um so the the way that a fire and rescue service can get to use things is, is first you need a license to be able to use that and, and, and as i mentioned at the end there um the university is currently in the process of handing over responsibility for doing things like that to the national fire chiefs council so as it stands there's a bit of a moratorium on issuing licenses until until that's finished um, which is ironic really but that doesn't stop people approaching me for example and saying you know can we have uh, can you come and train sort of six or eight people in how to use the system? Because there's been an agreement that that can that process can still carry on, and then the license can be applied for retrospectively as and when the the handover process is completed. Um, so, but once you have a license, that then entitles you to all the materials. So the materials that you get for free include um, familiarization training for your incident commanders about the system, so that the people that are going to be judged using your system actually understand what it's about and what's being looked for um, it includes all the documents that you saw come up uh, during the course of the presentation and the app as well um, and and also you know i'm here to offer some advice on how and um, best how to implement it certainly i can give you a list of considerations that i know hampshire went through uh, in order to, to figure their way through what has taken them about three years to get it to the level where they've got it to. So it's not about dumping it on your organisation all in one go quickly. Uh, I think the best way forward is choose where you cut the pie first and then just progressively develop it from that point at, onwards. Um, and then once, that's, uh, once you're sort of up and running, once you've had your training, um, there is the, the one, when the NFC take it over, um they're going to have a sort of national work i don't know what they want to call it but let's let's call it a, a little working group that really will involve anyone that has a license in order to sort of main you know to sort of uh, create a forum where the service can talk about how it's used um what needs to change about it because the one thing that thinks is is not a permanent structure because as technology and time passes um, there will be things that become slightly less redundant or some of the behaviours will change because of, you know, that bit's done by a bit of artificial intelligence now and isn't done by an incident commander, for example. So it's not a static system. It does need to evolve over time. And with the service taking it on, that's, that gives it the best opportunity for that to take place. You mentioned in the app as well, it can, it, it can recommend additional training if it picks up that somebody needs it. Does it give specific recommendations of, of specific training or will it just highlight training is needed in X, Y, Z? No, so it doesn't give specific um, examples of what training is needed. Um, back in 2015, 15, 16, um, I conducted a survey of, of UK Fire Service Incident Command training managers um of which um uh, of which we had a, a really high return so i sent it out to about 45 47 different services and we got sort of nearly 30 re responses so a very high percentage for a survey an online survey uh, and that showed us that all the command skills that make up thinks are trained for in the services even even then and i imagine that since grenfell and since uh you know other incidents that have occurred uh, you know, terrorist related incidents, for example, that 
that, that that training has evolved and developed and maybe become slightly more prominent than it otherwise was back then. Um, so we know that it's out there and it's being trained. So therefore, the system, what the system does is highlight where someone needs some more training. It doesn't say what that training should be because that, you know, we leave that up to the services to judge what's best for their own personnel. Um, possibly one last question then. Is the THINKS assessment model being utilised as a standalone module or can it be incorporated into current national IC assessment models? Oh, what, I'm, I'm intrigued by what they mean by a national IC assessment model. Can it, could, that, could that be clarified? Oh, yeah, Reese, who's typed that question, I wonder if you could just expand on that or if you're happy to, for, to, to sort of talk or verbally sort of say that the question, we can unmute you, Reese, if you want to pop your hand up or we can get a bit more information then because I wouldn't want to second guess. Them. <laughs> well, so, so the one thing that I can, one can, oh, so Reese is uh, joining us. Uh, Let's see. Oh, hi, both. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, yes hi, yeah, we can, Reese. Hi. Yeah, great stuff. Uh, Phil, Charlotte, thanks for the presentation. Really, uh, really informative and, and good to see. Um, just to clarify with a question, um, purely from national assessment models of WM7 and, and EFSM2, right, right. through Skills for Justice, will the, the Think Behavioural Marker System sort of be interlaced with that model or will it be utilised as a, a standalone assessment tool? Well, so as you probably know, uh, Reese, that the Skills for Justice National Incident Command qualifications were, are under review at the moment. And last I heard, and this was some time ago, they are looking to add a behavioural dimension to the skill set that's required of, of commanders. Um, so, so, and the, the draft that I've seen has, has clearly got strong relationships with things. So it's not exactly the same because it wouldn't need to be exactly the same because it's not trying to describe a behavioral marker system. It's trying to describe what skills uh, and what behaviors are important um, within the performance of those skills in order to help uh, incident commanders gain a qualification. So it's, it's in the mix, I think is fair to say. Uh, and that's all I'm able to say at this stage. So it's not something that's being ignored by the national uh, skills for justice qualifications they're actually considering it as we speak lovely thanks very much we'll uh, we'll have a look through the uh, the sfg info yeah yeah lovely thanks very much reese i think we've answered all the questions that there is um phil but obviously anybody else on the call wants to pick anything up you've had um phil's email address so do drop him a line if you didn't get it I think Jess and Claire, who you've probably had some information from, drop them a message and they'll be able to forward it on to Phil or pass his email address on to you. Um, Phil, thank you so much for a really welcome. detailed session. I think it was from somebody who was, it was not from the fire service, <laughs> really, really interesting. And sort of, it was a great thing to listen to. Um, as I mentioned at the start, everyone, we'll be circulating some evaluations at the end of next week, which is the end of our virtual summer school. Please do drop us um, complete it because it's really important for us to continue this kind of free summer school work that we have these evaluations. And from a professional development point of view, we're really interested to know in what your current and your future professional development needs are. Um, We've got a whole host of other sessions running over the next two weeks. If you haven't signed up to any, they'll all be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel for you to look back at your own convenience. Um, but thanks again to Phil and thank you all for listening. Have a good yes, afternoon. Thank you very much for your interest, everybody. Thanks all. Bye.